Peter Pass. I play the viola, and uh, I play in the São Paulo Symphony Orchestra. And uh, I was on tour in uh, Italy recently. And uh, as the tour finished up, I had a few extra days, so I thought it would be nice to come to Vienna and visit to Mastic to meet all these nice people that I've been corresponding with for many years, uh, and to actually meet them in person. And today we're here to talk a little bit about my experiences with the strings and uh, you know, about, about the viola and, and different, different strings. For a long time, I didn't use social media, and then my wife convinced me one day that I was doing many things that people should know about. She said, look, you play in this quartet, you do this with your, you have students and you're doing all of these things. You really should publicize some of this, you know, just open up an account and, and start just showing people a little bit of what you do because they ought to know about this. So I did this and from there, eventually um, a person, uh, one of the people at Tomastik reached out to me to offer me um, a new set of strings to try. There, there was a new product at that time there was a new product, which was the Peter Infeld strings for viola, which had just come out, and uh, he offered to send me a set of them to try them. And so I was like, oh yeah, I would love to try, I'd love to try new strings. And I put the Peter Infeld strings on them, and they were absolutely fantastic. I loved them immediately, love at first sight, or at first sound. And uh, I don't know how it happened, but somehow from there, the relationship developed into one where I became um, an artist, uh, an endorsing artist for Tomastic, and uh, that was maybe six years ago, I think, about six years ago, yeah. The funny thing is that we can trace this all back to the fact that I opened a social media account and I started to publicize my work, and this was because of my wife, so every time something fabulous happens with Tomastic, for example, this in interview process, she says, and you see, <laughs> we can trace this all back, and who is the one who... <laughs> so, I owe my wife a lot for that. <laughs> so I started with Suzuki violin when I was three years old. Um, I played the violin until maybe I was about 12, 12 years old, and at that, at that point I was growing, I had become very tall, and I had big hands, and um, you know, uh, in a small town in Saskatoon, in Western Canada, they were looking, as many places do, they were looking for viola players, and I seemed to fit. And the violin was getting very small for me also. I was playing the violin and it was kind of like this. And, <laughs> um, and so then my, my, my violin professor said, why don't you try the viola? And so I took a viola one day and all of a sudden my shoulders dropped and it was more, more comfortable and I loved the sound of it. I loved the lower sound, the lower register sounds. So from there, I never went back to the violin. I still have my violin, but I haven't opened it for, <laughs> for a very, very long time. Yeah. So one of the biggest challenges as a student was learning to get the most out of my viola. Because as a student, we don't have access to a great instrument. I'm very fortunate that I have a really fantastic viola now, but I've had it for 10 years. Um, and so for most of my playing life, I have been playing with an instrument which has helped me to do some things, but which I've had to fight with for other things. I have had to struggle to make the viola sound good in this part or to make... And uh, this is a challenge that I've had all of my life until, until recently. And uh, as a student, then you're working and you're practicing hours and you're trying to get absolutely the perfect sound and get exactly the thing. And many times you are struggling with the instrument. I mean, part of it is learning how to make it happen technically. You, know, you, you, you have to learn how to execute this technique. You have to, how to make the detaché the most beautiful sound, how to make the legato the best. But sometimes the viola doesn't respond in a certain register. Sometimes it's not clean. Maybe some violas have more resonance on, you know, anybody that has an instrument that they're looking to upgrade knows that the instrument has strong points and it has weaker points. Um, and so it's, it's a struggle during, during a musician's life to um, work with what the instrument can offer. But the strings can do a lot to uh, alleviate that because if you put really, really good strings on the instrument, it makes the instrument actually better you know, then if you just buy the cheapest thing that is available and you just put any strings on there, or if you use them for like two years until they break, um, 
which I did at one time because I couldn't afford to change them. But when I could change them, I remember at that time, the best strings that were available were dominant, in my opinion, at that time. Those were the, those were the best strings I, that we could get. And so anytime I had the extra money to buy or if I was you know, noticing that it was time to change, I would start to save and, and, and buy a new set of strings because I knew that this would make the viola sound better and it would make it easier to play for a long time. And I think this is, this is something that happens with, with, with strings, um, is that they're an expensive investment, but they give, um, they give it a wonderful return. Strings are responsible for like 25% of the outputs of, of an instrument. You know, you have the bow, you have the instrument, but then you have the strings also. And uh, I don't know about this number, whether this is true or not, but it's, it makes a lot of sense, you know, that, that the strings are enormous parts of what the instrument is able to do. And now that I have a really good viola, I can say that with all the different products that I've tried, all the different strings that Thomas Dick makes, I've tried in the last year, I've tried the Rondo, I've tried the new Dominant Pro, which is coming out soon, and uh, the Peter Infeld, which has been the string that I've been playing since I tried them the first time. Um, and they are all very special in their own way. I learned so much from my professors, but one of the most important pieces of advice had to do with choosing a career path. I went to my professor at the beginning of my bachelor's degree um, uh, in the first semester, and uh, I worked for four years out of high school and uh, played in an orchestra, and then I went back to university. So I was 20 years old when I started, and um, at that time I had decided that I was going to be an orchestra musician. I thought, well, I played in orchestra and I'm probably going to play in orchestra because I don't have a solo career. It doesn't seem like that's something that's on the horizon. So probably I'm going to play in an orchestra. So I thought, well, I have to, I have to practice for auditions. I need to start to work on this repertoire and it's, it's very, very competitive. Um, so I went to my professor and I said, Professor, I would, love to, uh, uh, I would love to bring some excerpts to you to work on excerpts. And he said, well, I would love to work on the excerpts with you, but why do you want to work on excerpts now? You're just at the beginning of your, of your bachelor's degree. And I said, well, you know, I think I'm going to be an orchestra musician eventually, so um, I should get started, you know, and start working on, 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 on this. And he said, well, it's very good to, to plan ahead, and yes, you should definitely be doing that. But, he said, I think that you should not think that you are going to be an orchestra musician, because you are going to close many doors if you do that. You sh I said, oh, okay, so what should I do then? He said, well, you should really think about being an artist and developing your artistry, developing your art and your artistic growth is what you should concentrate on. So you should go and hear all the wonderful musicians here. At the, this is at Indiana University. You should go to hear the master classes of uh, Jeno Starke and the Menachem Prester. You hear the cello and the violin and Joseph Gingold. Go to their classes and learn from them and absorb everything you can. Um, and learn as much as you can from everywhere that you can. And uh, in this way, you will grow, but you don't actually close any doors. Eventually, if you're going to be an orchestra musician, then you will go as an orchestra musician, but with a very large, expansive knowledge of a lot of different areas. Um, but who knows, maybe you will become a quartet musician. And actually, the, the, the truth is that I now am an orchestra musician. I also play in a quartet and I also teach. And if I had focused only on the orchestra excerpts during that time, maybe I wouldn't be playing in a quartet, you know, because I wouldn't have the skills. But instead, during my time at school, I did a lot of chamber music and I left that possibility open as one of the things that could happen. So um, that, was one of the, that was one of the most important pieces of advice that, that, that I received as a student. I think there's, a, there, there's a, an important thing for musicians um, to learn to have confidence. This is, really this is a difficult thing because we, we are so self-critical when we're in the school stage. I mean, we're listening and we learn to be critical so that we can improve ourselves. But then it's, um, it's, some, it's, it's difficult to turn that off or at least filter it when we are evalu evaluating our performance, for example, in an audition, in a recital, in a concert or something like that. Um, that that critical ear, um, somehow you have, we have to learn to teach it to relax a little bit sometimes and say, you know, yeah, okay, there were, there were, there were some details there that were not perfect and things like that, but there were a lot of good things too. And to, to learn to appreciate um, the good things we do 
and to value those is very important because I think um, sometimes um, we can lose confidence if we are too self-critical all the time. You know? and so there has to be a balance, I think. I think there are two schools of thought. You can either be a perfectionist, and when you are a perfectionist, it's very difficult to be artistic as well, because you are trying to reproduce something that you have planned. Um, and there is not a lot of room for flexibility when you are trying to make a carbon copy, when you are trying to reproduce exactly what you have planned, because you, know, you don't have a lot of flexibility with that. And so this can lead to absolutely impeccable, perfect performances. Um, but they are not always the most interesting to listen to. Um, so when you are trying to perform and do something that, that is, create something that is, that is spontaneous, uh, ephemeral in that moment, and which is going to be different every time, it comes at a at a bit of a price because you take risks. And then when you take risks, you always have the possibility that something will go wrong. Of course, the most outstanding artists that we have that are you know, touring the world and playing with all the major orchestras do both of these things. You know, they are creative, they are spontaneous, and they are creating wonderful moments, and they're working at absolutely the highest levels of technical perfection as well. So they, they have managed to get both of those. I'm still working on that, <laughs> the technical perfection part of it, and on the artistic side of that. Uh, I think there's a lot of room to grow, always. I hopefully, hopefully I will feel this until my very last day, uh, because I think that there is always something more that we can learn um, about technically how to do something, or about how to think about something musically. There's, there's no limit to the amount of knowledge that we can have, I think. I don't think you'll ever, I don't think I will ever think yeah, I know it all. <laughs> just, <laughs> I don't see that happening for me. I think the world is, you know, there's always more, there's always more to learn. So it's important to have an open mind. I received recently the new Rondo strings for viola. And so I put them on my instrument. Um, I had been using Peter Infeld. I have been using Peter Infeld for the last six years or so since, since the first time I tried them. And the first thing I noticed was that it was two things, actually. The first two things I noticed. One, uh, the first thing is that the strings are not quite as potent. They are not as uh, powerful on my viola um, as the Peter Infeld strings. But they are more rounded. They, they have a sweeter sound. And I remember that I put them on during a week when we were recording um, a Brazilian guitar concerto um, for, for, with my orchestra, and I had a small solo to play. And uh, we had three concerts, we, uh, three concerts plus uh, a number of recording sessions to do, and in, in between a couple of those, I had the crazy idea to try the new strings <laughs> because I wanted to see how it goes. So we had already recorded the solo, and uh, then I decided to try the new strings, and I put the rondo strings on um, for the, the third concert. And I actually had a couple of people come to me and say, wow, your solo sounded really beautiful today. The, the, it was very sweet sounding. I said, wow, that's, that's really interesting because I just changed my strings. I have, it's a brand new string. And um, so that was my first experience with Rondo. They, they um, are absolutely, they have just a really, what I would say is a really sweet sound. They're very sweet sounding. They have a lot of quality to the sound. Um, the Peter Infeld strings compared to them, are not as naturally sweet, but they are more powerful. So that was the difference between these two strings. So I have Dominant Pro on my viola right now. I've only had them for a week, but uh, they're absolutely fantastic. Um, they are very, very brilliant, um, but at the same time, they have a lot of quality to their sound. You know, they have a this kind of chocolatey, velvety sound that um, it just sounds like, it sounds like, a, it, it's like, like you're hugging, um, you're hugging the sound. It's just so warm sounding, you know, like, or you're being hugged by it, maybe is a better way to say it. Um, be, because it just sounds so warm, 
you know, and uh, this is the kind of sound that I imagine that a viola should have. I played these in our quartet concerts in Italy last week, and uh, they were absolutely spectacular. The dominant pro with the, with the quartet to blend in with the group, because there is some soloistic playing to do in the quartet, of course, with with some solos here and there. But there's a lot of blending to do as well, and uh, it was really the strings made it so much easier. It sounds like a cliche, you know. All oh, the strings made my life easier, but really, really, the, um, the, these 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 dominant pro strings have really made things easier to, to play and easier to play in the quartet. I still haven't tried them in the orchestra, so we'll see how they work in the orchestra. But I imagine if they work well in the quartet, they'll definitely they'll definitely work well in the orchestra.